Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions at Jane. And today we're gonna to be talking about Ultimate Spring Rose Care Guide. Now, I'm really excited about this. I really do enjoy growing roses. I enjoy looking at roses. I really enjoy, you know, being able to apply fertilizers to my roses and see what happens, you know, kind of from a scientific standing back and experimenting. I find them really a joy to uh, be around and take care of and watch what happens because they do uh, respond very uh, accurately to what I'm doing. But uh, one thing's for sure, as I talk to people about roses and see people interact with their roses, uh, oftentimes they think that they're very hard to grow or there's some mystique or mystery about roses that just make them hard, not something the average gardener or casual gardener wants to take on. And so uh, today I'm really excited because we have uh, Andy Bellingary, National Sales Manager for Jane Irrigation, taking us through this journey and kind of demystifying roses for us. Um, Andy's got a great background to do this. Uh, he was a uh, horticulture major at uh, BYU. Uh, he graduated that program. I had, had dinner with him and his professor one night a few years ago, and I asked uh, Phil, I go, was Andy a good student? He said, absolutely, he was a great student. And I already know that in knowing uh, uh, Andy's uh, thirst and interest in uh, continued education. I, I, I knew he was a good student. And um, uh, the other thing about Andy is he's, he's been involved in horticulture uh, his uh, entire life, his professional life, uh, working as a contractor, and then uh, working the last seven years now for Jane. So uh, with that, uh, Andy, welcome. Um, and tell us, you know, is it that hard to grow roses? No, it really isn't. Uh, but I know what you're saying, because, you know, roses have a unique place in our culture. Uh, as, as not just gardening, but in cut flowers, though. I mean, roses, st uh, I think, are, are uh, different than almost any other landscape planted out there. I don't know of, of many petunia clubs or, or boxwood clubs that exist, but there's a lot of rose clubs and rose societies. And you can see over my, my right shoulder, I've got uh, an encyclopedia of roses. I mean, thousands and thousands of, of roses. And, but it, there's also this, this cultural attachment that goes along with it, right? Um, as I mentioned, you know, hundreds of species of roses, thousands of hybrids. And I think that has to do with the emotional attachment we feel towards roses. I just, I, I like to tell a quick story on that. When I was a kid, probably the first eight years of my life, the house we lived in uh, was a house my dad purchased from his parents. It was the house that he grew up in. My grandma loved roses. In fact, her, her, her uh, rose was a family name even. That's how much they loved roses in the family. And she had a beautiful rose garden. So as a little kid, you know, we kind of inherited that. Always loved those. I'd go to her house. She had a beautiful rose garden. Uh, my, my grandpa one year uh, gave my dad for Christmas, a bear, he gave him a bare root uh, rose. He planted that, that, that rose is still growing. So there's like this, this, this sentimental, you know, the feeling we have with these, these roses as well. And I think sometimes because of that, you, you see the care that people put into it. The average guy thinks I can't grow roses. They're just, they're too hard. Um, you know, but I hope in today, you know, this, this, this 30 minute discussion more or less will help to demystify uh, some of that, simplify some of the, the things that I've learned through study, uh, experience over the years, and to, to really show you that, that you can grow roses and you can, you can have them look beautiful. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, Andy, the rose uh, industry in general, right? They really caught on to what you were just saying. And you can see in even the naming of their roses, oh, later, yes. right? You can buy a Miranda Lambert rose yes. and a certain portion of the proceeds of those roses are going to uh, humane societies. So, uh, you know, this emotional connection we have to roses uh, is even getting stronger, even with the naming and what they're doing with, uh, with the proceeds. We call those patented roses. You go to the store, you look at it, and it'll say Floribunda, Granda Flora, something or other, Abraham Lincoln, or <laughs> whatever, you know, Miranda Lambert, you, you name it, you got that rose in there. And um, types of roses that are out there, right? a simple list here, again, there's hundreds of species. Here's a simple list. There's climbing roses. You have miniature roses. There's landscape roses. And that's really not a technical term. That's just a broad definition of another category of roses. There's ground cover roses, polyantha, floribunda, hybrid tea, grandiflora, a lot that are out there. For today's discussion purposes, 
we're going to focus on the three or four that are most common the grandiflora the hybrid tea and the floribunda um, the grandiflora actually is a is a cross between a hybrid tea and a floribunda it has has the characteristics of both these are the roses that you you typically see in the rose garden right sometimes these are referred to as shrub or bush roses even though technically that's a shrub rose could be a completely different type of rose, but these are the these are the roses we think of. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today, um, as we as we talk about uh, you know so, some some best practices that will help you uh, succeed with growing roses. Um, I just want to mention too, Andy. Sorry to interrupt, but we do have both the chat box and the Q and A open. So if you have questions as Andy's presenting, put your questions in there, and uh, I will. Uh, uh, get as many of those questions as I can to Andy during the presentation. So thank you. Yeah, and bring the questions in. And, and if I do not know the answer, because sometimes it's well, it depends, right? There's there's a lot. I I I, I promise I will uh, I'll get back to you and help you figure out what that, that answer is. So please use that chat. I want this to be interactive as possible. So basic concepts that we'll cover today, and, and I want to start with this idea that. Putting in a little work in the spring, late winter, spring, will pay big dividends all year long. Um, and I think this is where sometimes roses sound difficult because you, you do have to put in a little work. It really isn't that bad. Um, some of this, these, these things that we'll cover today, this work includes pruning, fertilization, irrigation, some best practices, um, you know, the importance of mulch. And then you have your ongoing maintenance schedule. So that's a, a basic overview of, of, what we'll, uh, of what we'll cover today. But the, the concept is you put the work in in the spring and it really makes it so much easier the rest of the season. And it's, uh, it's, it's no different than planting a seed, right? You, uh, you, you plant the seed and you, you expect a result at the end. Roses are the same way. So the first concept we'll talk about here is pruning. And why are we pruning, right? So the, the purpose of pruning a rose is because we want to encourage growth on flowering wood. We want to we want to pruning any plant material. You prune to get a response out of the plant. So it's true with roses as well. I'm going to prune my rose bush so I can grow more wood that is uh, going to produce the blooms that I want. Um, that's that's one of the primary reasons we're pruning. We're also pruning, pruning to remove dead wood and diseased wood, things that uh, if you go back, if I go back and slide this picture here, well, here we are with a pair of uh, Corona clippers cutting off some, it looks like this is probably frost or freeze damage, either way, cutting it out so uh, we can reduce uh, disease introduction, keep the plant healthy. So that's another re reason we prune, to get rid of dead and diseased wood. Also damaged, uh, we wanna get rid of that. Uh, in humid environments and even even dry environments, we, we also want to prune to increase air circulation. And that becomes important because with poor air circulation, the humidity goes up and then it becomes a breeding ground for a fungus. And, you know, a powdery mildew, for example, is one of those. So we want to prune to create air circulation. Um, we do that by removing crossing branches and uh, it kind of open up a, a vase shape, you know, that, that V vase shape, open center. It, uh, roses do really, really well with that. And then ultimately what we're trying to do when we're pruning these roses is to uh, shape the plant. A good rule of thumb, um, cut it back by about two thirds is, is, is generally, you know, a, a, good, a good practice to follow. Um, I know, uh, one third to two third would be, would be the general rule of thumb, depending on the kind of blooms you're looking to get. So uh, the heavier pruning you do, you'll get bigger blooms, but less of them. Uh, the more the, the less pruning you do, you'll get more blooms, but they'll be smaller in size. So that's kind of that one third to two thirds. So that's just a good rule of thumb to follow. And I threw this in here. Everybody has heard this. And I've got a picture that illustrates this principle. Well, you got to cut just above the outward facing bud. And if it's an eighth inch too much, well, then you left too much, an eighth inch too low. That might be true. I have never followed that principle per se. I mean, strictly. And I've seen some, I've had some really good rose displays. Um, but uh, that, that is something you hear quite a bit. I wouldn't stress so much over that. I think that becomes important if you're trying to get shape, right? If you want a branch that goes outward instead of inward, maybe you could begin to make that cut, force the plant to grow where you want. 
but that is one of those things that people hear a lot. I think it stresses them out when it comes to pruning. I wouldn't put too much worry into it. You can still get a good blossom display without counting buds and uh, getting an exact 45 degree angle on your cut. Yeah, that's, uh, you're, you're totally right. And, you know, I was uh, watching a guy a few years ago. He grows uh, 1,800 acres of uh, roses in uh, Arizona. And uh, he was saying, oh, yeah, this is me pruning. Clip, 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 clip. <laughs> he said, yeah. you know, I don't really pay that much attention to it, and I'm doing just fine. Yeah. So I'm going to show some pictures and practice it. And I did this in my yard three weeks ago. And even though I was like making notes and taking pictures while I was doing this, I don't think I spent more than, I, this was everything I was doing. I don't think I spent more than maybe 15 or 20 minutes per rose bush. It, it, it doesn't have to be, I mean, so when I say invest some time, I mean, five, five rose bushes, I was, I was, you know, done in, in a little over an hour. And, and uh, that, that's, that's the, the time I'm talking about invest. It's not very much at all. Um, so here's, here's a picture of a, a, a rose in my front yard. This is in January. Um, for those of you in the Las Vegas area, the, you know, the desert Southwest, Phoenix, Vegas, you know, uh, you know, San Bernardino, some of those parts of California. If you're like me, your roses in January will look better than they do in, in July, August. Um, especially when we've had a mild winter, we have more of a summer dormancy than we do a winter dormancy. But this is this is my my rose bush in January. Now I could have let it go, uh, but it wouldn't have done as good the following year. So I start with this. As you can see, it still has some blooms on it. There's I need to do some deadheading. It had a lot of growth over the the past year. A lot of stuff crisscrossing. Uh, first thing I did is I came in. I cut out all of anything that was dead or damaged. You no, know, my my son throws a football in the rose bush and. It, breaks a branch off, kind of semi-connected, I cut that out. Anything that was dead, I cut that out. Anything that was uh, crossing, I cut that out. Um, but the question becomes, uh, and, I, and, and I, I apologize, I should have started with this. The question becomes, when is the right time to prune? How do I know when it's uh, the right time to prune? It could be, Richard, I think you said down in San Diego, you guys are doing it as early as middle of December. I know, I know uh, parts of California, even into Vegas, Phoenix, uh, January, we're pruning. Uh, maybe there's areas in the Pacific Northwest or other parts of the country, they may not start pruning until May. It really depends on the weather and the circumstance. But I, I, I threw this picture in here. The rose bush will tell you. Now, this is the picture of a perfectly cut, you know, 45 degree angle with the bud pointing out. But I'm not putting this picture in here to show you the perfect cut. What I am showing you is how the rose bush can tell you when it's time to prune. That is a swollen bud. That is a new bud. Uh, the rose bush trying to push new growth. You see that bud start to swell a little bit. When when you see that, that's that's when you know it's time to prune. And that's a great photo, Andy, because I've heard that term before when the bud starts to swell, and I really wasn't sure what that meant before, and uh, I certainly. Uh, I certainly see that now. And um, yeah, we had one of our uh, audience members saying Las Cruces, New Mexico, February 14th for pruning. So Valentine's Day, hey, that's February 14th is when we plant tomatoes in Vegas. It's, uh, it's yeah. yeah, so yeah. yeah, depends on the weather, right? Yeah, depends on the weather. And, and every year can be a little bit different, but it's good to have those target dates, you know. Uh, and you could probably go, you know, a week or two before or after you see the bud in this stage. But and you see buds swell like this on also you see it on on uh, peach trees, plum, apricot. The buds will start to swell uh, long before you see any blossoms or leaves break. That's when you know, you know, it's the sign that the plant telling you it's getting ready to do its thing. So, Andy, um, for you in Las Vegas, if you did nothing, you would have roses year round. Is that right? Yes, but I would not have, you, you start to get a display. Now, this looks good in January. Had I done nothing, I can tell you that yeah, I would have gotten a nice flower display in the spring. It wouldn't have been as nice, but by summertime, it just, the plant would have looked really tired. I would have had a lot of chlorosis, spindly growth. I mean, just, they just start to get old and tired. You see this with a lot of landscape plant material. They benefit from a, a, a rejuvenation of sorts. Uh, rejuvenation pruning just to the left of that rose bush. I have some lantana. I had just right before I took this picture, cut that back hard. I do that with my British Ruellia. I cut that back hard too. Flowering plants really do well with uh, some rejuvenation pruning and roses um, are not the exception. 
Yeah, so I, I don't want to be skipping ahead here, Andy, and I'm not sure if I am or not, but um, now when you prune, do you remove all the leaves too? I do, yeah, that's that's one of the steps, absolutely. And I'll, I'll show you, yeah, you're skipping ahead. <laughs> but that's a good question, good question. So um, here, here's after I removed the dead, the dying, the damaged, and, and some things that were crossing. I know it looks like there's a big branch crossing there in the picture, but that's just, it's the angle it's at, it's coming out. So I come in, uh, step one, dead, dying, crossing, I'm opening it up, okay? And then I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, okay, I, you know, I, I'm starting to, to thin it out and shape it a little bit. I'm, I'm, I, I, this is a good rule of thumb that someone told me a long time ago, and I've seen it mentioned on a lot of uh, rose uh, growing books and, and, and literature and so forth. Spindly growth, and, and what does that mean? Well, if, if there's a branch or a stem that's smaller than the diameter of a pencil, remove it. And so after I do that, um, you know, you start to shape it a little bit more. Good point you brought up, brought up just a second ago, removing the leaves. Now, um, I think you do it for the same reason I do. My, my, my plant would keep leaves on year round. By removing the leaves, I can force dormancy. You give the plant a chance to rest a little bit, slow down, you know, the photosynthesis and all those things that are going on. Remove those old leaves, get them out of there. And here, here's, here's a, a, for me, a, a pruned rose bush. Now this, this, this happens to be a white iceberg rose which is a floribunda, which has more of a, uh, a, a different growth pattern than a hybrid tea would have. So, you know, look at this. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't look like, you know, where's the, where's the three main uh, canes coming up? Well, that would be more of a hybrid tea. And these, these white iceberg, they just, uh, this, this works really well. Um, I, I kind of shoot the middle between heavy pruning and light pruning. I know guys with these uh, white iceberg roses that will will strip the leaves and just take a little bit of, of wood off and they get a ton of tiny flowers covered on it. I know guys will cut back really, really hard and get just a few larger flowers. I kind of go in between that, but this is, this is, uh, you know, done pruning. This is where I would be. And so just a couple of uh, additional keys to remember, a summary on pruning, if you will. Moderate pruning produces more but smaller blooms. Heavier pruning produces fewer but larger blooms. Uh, good rule of thumb, remove branches or stems that are smaller than the diameter of a pencil. Removing the leaves forces dormancy. It's a good practice, especially if you're in a uh, uh, you know, southwest uh, coastal areas where it never gets cold enough to force a dormancy. And then this is a good time to, uh, to apply your dormant oils to kill any overwintering pests or fungus. Um, Volk is a good oil. I, I've never uh, struggled with that, but uh, this, this is the time to start to, to apply those dormant oils. Yeah, excellent, uh, Andy. We've got a couple of questions that are coming in too. Um, and one, one question is about um, planting roses and grapes together. Uh, you know, about, you know, does this work okay? How do you feel about that? So I've been to vineyards and I've seen that at the end of those, those lines, sometimes they'll have roses there. Um, evidently works well because the vineyards are doing it. <laughs> Well, aren't the, I, I think the vineyards are doing it right because they're using that uh, rose as a canary, right? Uh, in the, in, the, uh, in yeah. the mine, right? If it's getting aphids or if it has problems, it's hitting the roses before uh, it's hitting the vine. So I think that's certainly helping them. But, um, and I know, you know, in, in, I love to put, you know, you were mentioning one time when you saw my garden, you said, oh, that's cool. You're growing, you know, squash between your roses and you'll see lettuce and everything else in between mine. But uh, yeah, it, um, that companion plants work great together. I've, I've, I've never, I, I don't know anything specific about grapes and roses, but uh, why not try? Sometimes it's fun just to experiment, see what works well together. Yeah, and then another question that's come in here is um, uh, a question about uh, pruning and do you fertilize when you prune, Andy, or do you wait? How, how do you deal with that? Yes, uh, good question. Um, that's the next topic we're gonna cover, fertilizing. <laughs> So uh, key components in fertilizer, and this, this may be basic. A lot of people may know this. If not, um, this will be a good review. If you've ever looked on a bag of fertilizer, you see numbers. It would be like 16, 20, 0, or you know, 6, uh, 12, 3. That, is, that stands for nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, NPK. And those numbers are a percent of the total. So if I see a 12, first number is 12, that means 12% of that material is nitrogen. 
right? Um, and so forth and so on with potassium and, and our phosphorus and potassium as well. Uh, nitrogen is very important. That is what, that's where we get the green growth. That gives it the, the, uh, the, the, the shoot and root growth, right? It comes from, from nitrogen. It's kind of the power. Uh, that's why we put so much nitrogen on, on, on turf to get it to grow. So nitrogen becomes very, very important for uh, growing roses. The second one, phosphorus, is extremely important, uh, especially when we're dealing with roses or anything producing fruit or flowers. Yes, phosphorus does help root growth, but even more important is the flower growth. Um, there's a product, it's a liquid fertilizer out there called Super Bloom, and I think it's like a 12556 analysis, so uh, you know, uh, almost four times as much, more than four times as much phosphorus than nitrogen because that phosphorus really helps you get those those powerful blooms good root growth but also gives you some nice blooms and then that last number in there the k the potassium which remember special k that cereal the mom used to eat it full of potassium just like bananas i think uh that's all around plant health uh so those are the what we call the macronutrients the major nutrients uh that, that are they're available that the plant needs there's also micronutrients that we want to make sure the, the roses are getting. Iron is especially important. Have you ever seen a plant that has kind of a pale yellow leaf with, with deep green veins or on roses, a white leaf? That's a sign of iron deficiency. And I'll talk more about that in the ongoing maintenance. But uh, roses also need calcium, magnesium, zinc. And I threw sulfur in there. This may not be the case for everybody, but if you're in the desert, a desert environment, an arid environment, we have very alkaline soils, high pH soils. What happens is when you get a soil pH that's too high, you might have iron or calcium or magnesium or these other nutrients there, but because the pH is so high, it's in a form that's not readily available. So as we try to lower the pH, we can do that through sulfur and through mulch applications, compost applications, we'll talk about a little bit, but we can, we can lower that pH a little bit to, to make it so those nutrients are available for the plant to uh, pick up. So, and I, you see this picture here on the screen. These are, these are uh, six bags of, of uh, some, some organic, uh, mostly all organic fertilizers that I use. And I'll show you my recipe here. Oh, let me, let me, let me, sorry. I, I, I should have show, show this a second ago. Uh, th this, this is just the label. You look on any bag of fertilizer, you can see this, the guaranteed analysis. Like for example, the 16, 16, 16, you can see that's 16% nitrogen. Um, of which you know 4% is ammoniacal, 2% is nitrate, 10% is water soluble, so forth and so on. So you can see the, the analysis of uh, that bag of fertilizer, know exactly what you're putting on. Okay, this is the this is the secret recipe, the spring startup recipe. And I uh, this comes courtesy of the Las Vegas uh, Rose Society uh, on a website that hasn't been updated in 20 years, but I've been using this since, oh boy, 15 years at least. And I swear by it, it's worked for me. Adjust it for the area that you're in, but for you desert dwellers, this will work. And so uh, half a cup of, this is per rose bush, okay? Half a cup of blood mill. Now the analysis of blood mill is 1300. We're using that, it's, it's organic, but it's fast release nitrogen. Now you could get some chemical inorganic nitrogen but I, I want to make a, a very important point here. This is true for roses. This is true for anything you're growing. We're not feeding the plant. And that's a misnomer sometimes. People try to feed the plant. We're not feeding the plant. We want to feed the soil. If we can improve the soil, the soil feeds the plant. And so if I can use an organic form of fertilizer that provides the nitrogen the plant needs, but also nourishes the soil, improves the soil, uh, it's all that much better for my plant. So blood mill does provide the nitrogen, but also it's improving my soil there. Um, next step in my recipe is one cup of cottonseed mill. That's, that's a slow release nitrogen. So that combination of a fast release and slow release, I'm gonna get immediate nitrogen for my plant, plus some stuff that's gonna be left there in the reserves. And that cottonseed mill will also have a little bit of phosphorus and potassium. And if you're in a high pH environment, the cottonseed will help uh, acidify the soil a little bit. Um, also putting in a cup of bone meal, which is a natural source of phosphorus, uh, and it's also high in calcium, calcium being one of those micronutrients that are needed. Um, phosphorus, remember that's where we're getting the big blooms from, but on top of the bone meal, I'm also putting in some superphosphate, which is another high source of phosphorus. Uh, sometimes it'll be called superphosphate, 
sometimes it'll be called triple phosphate, but it's just, a, it's a really good, if you use a triple phosphate, use only about a half a cup, but it's a good source of phosphorus. Uh, the next one that's on there is magnesium sulfate, otherwise known as Epsom salt. As a kid, I never could figure out why my grandma would put Epsom salt on her roses. And the day that I went out there with table salt and started sprinkling them on her rose bed, she was, <laughs> she came unglued. Um, I later learned magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt, uh, of course, high in magnesium. Magnesium helps prevent chlorosis, number one. But number two, magnesium is, is a key element in chlorophyll. It's a building block of chlorophyll. And without chlorophyll, you can't have photosynthesis. And so, especially where we can go through the heat of the summer, the plant needs to be as strong as possible. Um, it becomes highly, highly important to have magnesium in there. And that's, that's been, a, uh, it's been good for roses for a long time. And so good old, good old Epsom salt. And then lastly, for my uh, guys in the, the, the desert areas, dealing with high pH, uh, high alkaline soil, a cup of soil sulfur uh, will, will help there. And then you just work into the soil two to four inches uh, around the drip line of the bush. And what I do, I, I put it into the bucket, enough for each row, mix it all together. You can see I've got my, my one cup measuring cup uh, that I stole from my wife. Um, and uh, I... I work that into the roses uh, uh, in, in the root zone. Now, I, I mentioned in there two to four inches. Be careful. A lot of times, the the root zone of roses are can be shallow and they're very fibrous, and you don't want to like get in there and like rototill it up a lot. You're gonna you're gonna tear up a lot of the roots. Gently scratch it into the surface, and you can you can have a uh, get those fertilizers down into there. So Andy, we're getting a lot of questions coming in and I'd like to take a few of them right now, if that's sure. okay with you. Absolutely. Okay, getting, sorry, I'm gonna go back to the pruning, right? But okay. so um, if, uh, if my, my roses have been dormant, right? Or I've pulled all the leaves off them and they're starting to get leaves back again, uh, is it too late to prune? No, it, it, that butts well, again, that, the, the, the rose is telling you, hey, now I'm starting to grow. That's when you know it's time to prune, whether it is coming out of dormancy or not. That's a good time to prune. Okay. Okay, great. And then, um, and I know you're going to get into irrigation a little bit, but uh, somebody noticed you've got a very uh, uh, observant group today uh, that you were using three different emitters on your rose bush earlier in the oh, photo. Yeah. yeah. I was uh, what what is the that. ideal setup for irrigation? Are you just going to cover that in a little bit? I'll cover that a little bit. That picture, I hesitated putting that picture in for that very reason. So I, I like to test. I'm, I'm, I'm a test gardener type of guy. So this was, you know, I have an ideal scenario that I'm going to show you. That happened to be uh, testing some different emitters, trying some different things. You know, I, uh, so yeah, very, very, very good observation. No, that's not ideal. That's, that's Andy liking to uh, test things. I, uh, I get, I get living on the edge of the desert. I get a lot of plants that blow into my yard. And my wife says, how come you haven't pulled the weeds? I'm like, well, I don't know what it is yet. I want to let it grow and see and see what it is. So anyway, that's just as part of my, my uh, love of, of letting things grow and then testing different ways to irrigate. Uh, I can tell you, I do have a, a preferred way to irrigate and I'll show you what that is. Um, that picture was not the preferred way. That was, uh, was part of more, more testing. Okay. All right. Great. And then uh, somebody else is asking about uh, dormant oil spraying, right? Uh, I'm thinking that when they're pruning their roses, they're using some dormant oil spray. Um, can that be done any time of the day? What, what do you recommend there? I, you know, I think, I think, you know, early in the morning or late at night's best. I, I, I know that if, if, and well, here's the other thing too, you want to, you want to make sure you're not, after you put that on, you don't want to be washing it off with water or something because it, it can wash off. I would say, um, you know, afternoon, it would be a good time. But in the winter, you should be safe in the middle of the day when you're putting that on. The best bet, depending on the, 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 the oil that you're using, follow the manufacturer's recommendation because the way they've compounded it, the way that it's been put together, it could, it, it could have some, some tricks or, or whatnot to it. Um, follow the manufacturer's recommendation on those and you'll be safe. Okay, great, Andy. Well, we caught up a little, I'll ask some more as we go along because we've got uh, quite a few pouring in. This is great. Okay, so hey, next section, irrigating, right? Um, when we're irrigating, 
uh, and this is true. This is true for roses. This is true for everything. If you've been on these uh, seminars, uh, webinars before, you know, we talk about, well, how do we irrigate? Well, it depends on where the roots are. How are the roots? How, you know, how deep are they? How mass together are they? How far out do they spread? Well, that's no different for roses. And I want you to pretend that this happens to be a tree, but this, this works for roses. Bird's eye view of a rose bush. You can see the green area would be kind of the plant canopy. And then you see the, the, the roots that extend out beyond that a little bit, a little beyond the drip line. Uh, roses, uh, similar to citrus trees and, and other plants, they have more of a fibrous root system rather than a tap root, they, they, they tend to be fibrous and they, they'll spread out over a, a big area. And knowing that helps us know how to irrigate it best. Now I'm gonna share with you what I've learned what is best specifically for drip irrigation. And there, there's a couple ways you could go about it. Somebody noticed in the picture before I had a point source emitter. Um, the biggest problem I've learned with this point source emitter is that number one, I'm not getting a, a, a one isn't going to be enough to spread the water where everywhere that I need it. You can kind of see how it spreads. I'm going to have to put multiple of those in there. And so then I think, how can I, what, what's a way where I can get the water kind of uniformly spread over the entire area in, in an easy uh, to set up way? And uh, the answer is emitter line. Here's a, here's a, a, a graphic of a emitter line. You can see how water spreads with um, emitter, emitter line. This happens to be quarter inch emitter line, the, the Jane brand of mini pep line that is, is very popular to sell. And you can see here on this next slide, um, this is how I've set it up. I, I've done a double ring for my rose bushes. Depending on your soil type and, and other things, you, you, you could get maybe get away with a single ring. Maybe you would need a triple ring. So you got to know your soil. But for me and my, uh, what I have, soil blend I have, I'm using a double ring, uh, 12 inch spaced mini pep line. And uh, you can see that, that a setup like that will get my root zone covered very, very well. And um, here, here is a uh, picture I took uh, a couple years ago, but that's Jane Mini Pep Line and um, probably in May, uh, sometime in May with one of those uh, white iceberg uh, bushes uh, in bloom. Um, that was the second bloom. The first bloom, almost the entire bush was covered. This was the second bloom. Uh, and the benefits of using this mini pep line is I'm able to evenly distribute the water where the plant roots are. Um, with drip irrigation specifically, sometimes when you're using point source emitters, if I came by with a granular fertilizer and I let that sit right on the surface, the only, it, it requires water to get the granular fertilizer to get into the soil. The only fertilizer that's going to get into the soil is the fertilizer that happens to land right where that emitter is. But if I, can, if I can spread the water everywhere with this mini pep line, for example, I can ensure that all my granulars are getting into the uh, soil. That's if I'm using a granular fertilizer. The other benefit of this is it is a slower application rate as, as opposed to like a shrubbler or a, uh, uh, you know, those, those bubblers that are putting out um, high volumes of water. Um, by, by slowing it down and using a drip irrigation, I can prevent fertilizer washout and, and, and mulch washout as well. And, um, you know, I, I didn't, we didn't get into this too much with, with uh, the, the fertilizer. Um, but we'll talk about it in the ongoing maintenance, but it's, it's, this drip irrigation is a great complement to fertigation. And we'll talk about fertilizer, um, ongoing fertilizer here in a minute, and, you know, granular fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, and fertigation. But it's just a little bit of a, a tease for uh, things to come. So Andy, if you were going to do a triple ring around your rose bush, this would be if you'd had really sandy soil. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the uh, more denser, the more clay your soil is, potentially a single ring, sandy loam or a loamy soil double ring and, and sandy uh, triple ring. That's right. And you could go back and watch the webinar. I think it was entitled, How Do I Irrigate That? I think we covered that spacing and you know sandy soil will have the water moves more in a column clay soil moves a little bit wider out and that that's those are some of those educated decisions you have to make when you're um deciding how to irrigate your plants uh double ring works great for me it's probably a good bet for most people yeah so do i have to worry about these uh these mini pep lines clogging or having problems if my uh, water is really hard or so yeah well a key component of any drip system uh, is a filter. And we've got a great webinar on that one as well. <laughs> uh, the purpose of a filter, put a filter on every drip system, make sure it's in there, make sure it's doing its job, keep, 
keep uh, those those particulates uh, out from because you can see these these emitters aren't very big. They could they could possibly plug. And the other thing I'll say for using your drip system is uh, once a month, once a quarter, go to the end of the line, open it up, and flush it out. Or you can uh, get an automatic uh, lateral flush valve that, that automatically flushes out. Keep keep the system flushed. If you're in a hard water environment, sometimes the calcium mineral deposits will build up inside there, and it's good to keep those flushed out. So you're going to talk about mulch in a minute, but I'm wondering too, can I put this mini pep line under mulch? I do. Absolutely. I absolutely do. So um, you know, here, here, here's what I did on mine. I had, I had about a three inch layer of, of, of bark mulch. Um, I pulled all that out, you know, just took it off the surface, worked the fertilizer in, inspected the irrigation line, make sure everything was working. It's, you know, good time to do that. Um, and then went back and, and, and covered it all back up with mulch again. Yeah. Um, with irrigation, a couple of best practices I want to share. Uh, for ongoing fertilizer, especially in the hot summer months, you can easily burn your plants. It's a good idea to, to irrigate before you fertilize and then irrigate after. So it, uh, having that moisture in the soil helps, uh, helps buffer the fertilizers a little bit. Um, and then what style of irrigation here? A light frequent watering produces shallow roots. Shallow roots mean when it gets hot or windy, your plant's gonna stress and it's, gonna, it's not gonna look good. So the alternative to that is a deep and frequent watering. That's what's most effective, what's most efficient. And this is where drip irrigation really um, shines. Um, and by, by going deep, you know, rose roots, could be anywhere from 18 to 24 inches. So get, getting the water that full depth and then, and then giving it time in between to breathe um, makes for a happy rose. But it also by watering it deeply, you're pushing salts out of the, out of the root zone um, that, can, that can damage those plants. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the root zone, those are gonna be 18 to 24 inches deep. You wanna make sure you're getting the water that deep. So that's, that's the, uh, th those are the keys to, to irrigation. I, I, I paused right here. Were there any other questions on irrigation before we, we got into mulch a little bit? Yeah, I think that was uh, everything on irrigation. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Great job on that. Well, good, good. Yeah, so we talked about mulch. Uh, I, I, I told you kind of what I do. Um, here's the reason I mulch. Number one, mulch retains soil moisture. It's a way to conserve soil moisture. Uh, it also helps retain nutrients. Uh, when you get into soil, the, the, the physiology of soil, you have, there's a thing called cation exchange capacity, CEC. Well, when you have uh, organic material in your soil, the organic material can hold on to those nutrients better sometimes than the soil can. So it helps retain those nutrients. It helps regulate soil temperature. Uh, rose, roses will have shallow feeder roots. And if it's, if, if the soil is not covered with mulch, the sun can come out, it can burn those up and, and dry them up and kill them. But if you have the, the mulch in there, it'll keep, it'll keep that uh, surface cool and it'll keep it moist and it keeps those roots healthy. Uh, roots are healthy uh, and happy. Your plant's gonna be healthy and happy as well. And, and uh, an organic mulch will decompose. It will break down over time. That it's going to add humic acid and all sorts of good things to your soil. It, it creates a living environment. That is the, uh, again, like I said, in fertilizing, we're not feeding the plant, we're feeding the soil. Anything we can do to make the soil healthier, you're going to have a healthier plant. And last but not least, it's a form of, of weed control. Um, now, I, I mentioned I, I keep a, a three or four inch layer, about three inch layer of, of, of uh, wood chips as mulch on mine. This picture doesn't show that. What I did when I pull that layer off, I have uh, some, some compost, just I have a compost pile, leaves I pick up around the yard, I compost them. I put, uh, I put that down first. And I do that because if it's composted, what can happen if it's uncomposted, sometimes it can rob nitrogen from the soil. So I'll put the compost layer down first and then the, the wood chips on top of that to help as, as an extra layer to keep it moist. So little thing I do, but uh, sometimes having partially composted uh, mulch will, will uh, uh, benefit your soil mold more than the uncomposted. And that's, that's, that's what it looks like afterwards. So, so mulch, um, last thing I'll say on mulch before we get into the ongoing maintenance, it's, it's, it's 
highly beneficial for roses, um, but it's, it's beneficial for all, all your plants. Having a, a, a cool soil that moisture retained, you'll, you'll see a difference. Trees as well, they, they really do. It makes a big difference in the overall quality. Uh, roses uh, really like it and they, they, that's where they really start to shine. So, so that, that was up to there. That is, you know, maybe 20 minutes worth of work per rose bush. I do that in the spring um, and that is the bulk of the work, but that doesn't mean the work is, there's still a little ongoing maintenance things to do here and there. Uh, this is the, the love of being in the garden. Uh, roses are heavy feeders and they need to be fertilized uh, periodically. Now I've heard anywhere from every two weeks to every eight weeks. And the answer is yes, <laughs> but it, it depends on what kind of fertilizer are you using. If you're using a foliar fertilizer, well, very little of that gets absorbed into the, the plant. So you have to do that every, every you know, week, every couple of weeks. If you're using a liquid fertilizer, well, that might be every two to three weeks. Granular, well, there's more that gets held in there. That's every six to eight weeks. And so it depends on, again, this is one of those things that depends. For an ongoing fertilizer regimen, I like a, a triple 20, just a balanced fertilizer. You can buy a specific rose fertilizer blend and it'll have both the macro and the micronutrients that you can work in um, to your, 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 your regimen. Um, but I'll tell you a trick of the trade and uh, it's called a fertilizer injector. And this is a, a device that takes liquid fertilizer and concentrate and injects it into your irrigation system at a at metered rate. And that way, every time you irrigate, you're applying a fertilizer. And so you could say, I could, I could dump a bucket of liquid fertilizer on my rose bush once every two to three weeks, or every time I irrigate, I could put that same amount of fertilizer out. It's, it's like spoon feeding the rose throughout the season. So um, if you don't have a, a fertigation system, I highly recommend them. Um, get a bag of, uh, of uh, uh, triple 20 uh, water soluble fertilizer and you will be, uh, you'll make your job that much easier. Makes life easier. Yeah, I, you know, Andy, I went this direction a few years ago uh, and I was amazed at the difference it made in my entire garden. Uh, just the spoon feeding through my drip system I wasn't shocking the plants with fertilizer. I was giving them just the right amount. And I, I really felt uh, that I could see the difference in just uh, a short period of time. And everything was uh, better colors, deeper colors, sharper, uh, and, and uh, the, the vigor of my garden, just the whole health of the garden uh, improved significantly when I went to a, a fertilizer injector. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I believe that I've seen the same thing. And, um, you know, Richard, I, I'll pick on you just a little bit. Living in San Diego, you guys are like the perfect climate, right? It's, you know, year round. And um, for those of us in Vegas, and, I, and you're from Phoenix, Richard, you, you know you know what a chore can be, how difficult it can be to, to and people think, oh, it's, it's Vegas, it's Phoenix, I can't grow roses, they just wilt away. Um, here's here's another another little tip little pro trick for uh the, the people in hot desert environments june july and august as i mentioned earlier that that's more of a dormant season than let's say december january mm -hmm. so if you're if you're in you know the the, the southwest the desert southwest and you get into these hot summer months where we're 105 110 115 degrees and you get the hot winds that go along with it cut your fertilizer applications back to half uh, the prolonged heat has, has the same dormancy effect as severe cold. So you cut the fertilizer application back, no sense wasting money or trying to force the plant to do something it doesn't want to do. But do add to that in those months, the Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, so that, that, that that'll help the plant get through the summer much, much better than, um, than otherwise. Um, that's, a, that's a great tip. I hadn't heard that one before, but uh, yeah, th thank you. And as I mentioned earlier too, this is the time of year throughout the growing season, we wanna watch for iron chlorosis. That's the yellowing of the leaves that affects roses. Uh, you see the yellow leaves with green veins, that's the iron chlorosis. And the best, the best way to correct that is with a chelated iron. The one I use is Key-Rex, but there's others that are out there. But there's two things that can cause iron chlorosis. One is overwatering. So if you're flushing all your nutrients out of the, of the soil, uh, you're going to have this problem. So um, may, maybe take a look at your, your, uh, your watering regimen and see, see what's going on. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe that's why you're having iron chlorosis. Fix that, save some water, 
um, and improve your plant health. The other thing that will cause this is high pH soil where the, the iron may be there, but it's, it's bound up because of that pH. And so the soil sulfur and organic mulch, organic mulch helps buffer the, uh, the pH and you can, you can solve that uh, chlorosis as well. Um, you know, moving on, it, part of maintenance, you're going to remove the faded blooms, deadhead them, you know, for the, your best effect. And that is going to initiate the next bloom cycle. Um, you know, how much water, I, you know, I touched on this a little bit in the irrigation, two to four gallons per bush during the hot summer. That's going to depend on your, um, where you're at as well. And then, um, you know, watching out for disease and, and insects, powdery mildew, thrips, aphids, uh, spider mites, they love to, to prey on roses. So you're going to want to watch out for those and, and, uh, and treat those as they come up. And, you know, last but not least here that you've, you've put all this work in, right? And this is an old saying, but it's it, it very applicable today. Don't forget to stop and smell the roses. Take, take, take a break, sit on the front porch with your cold glass of lemonade and, and enjoy the rose. You put all that work into it, sit back and enjoy the show. And, uh, um, you know, don't forget to stop and smell one occasionally. It's uh, one of the one of the best treats in life is uh, uh, a very fragrant rose. Yeah, excellent, Andy. Very very interesting and a, a very good message at the end. Uh, have a couple questions here. We still want to clear up uh, uh, any any uh, experience with thrips uh, and what what you do to uh, take care of that pest. Yeah, thrips. I I have I have that. I've had that pest the past three years and you can see thrips. I see them um, when the flower, the rose starts to open up. You see like brown, at least on my white rose, I see some brown edges. The, the, the bugs are inside the, the, the blossom. They're eating that up. Um, I've, I've used, what I've, <laughs> I've tried a lot of different things. Um, what I've found to work the best is a systemic um, pesticide that, that uh, I've had a problem with aphids, white flies, thrips, uh, spider mites. Um, a, a systemic, usually one or two applications of a systemic that has a fertilizer in it. And on top of that, uh, I, I get out there with the hose and I'll spray everything down that uh, knock, knock those off. But um, the best advice I have, the thing that's worked best for me is a systemic. I've tried, I've tried ladybugs. I've tried so many different things and, uh, um, man, I, I hate to do it, but that bear, uh, bear is the one I use. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. And then any experience with rose canker? Do you get that in, uh, in Vegas? And what do you, what do you do about it? No, I haven't had that, but my guess is you could have mulch or si soil piled up too high and probably as a function of overwatering as well, but I've, I don't have any uh, firsthand experience with it. Okay. Another question about irrigation. We have somebody asking about uh, instead of putting two rows of mini pep, you know, two circles of mini pep line, what if I just stayed with one and irrigated longer? So, okay. It's, it's not about, it's the, what we're trying to do with, with the rows. It's not about how deep we're going with the water. It's how wide we can get the water. And so if I have a sandy soil, I may be only, only able to get it, you know, eight inches wide. Um, and that may not cover the entire root zone. That's why I'm going to that second uh, row of mini pep line. So the number of rows isn't how deep we're going or how much water we're giving it. It's, it's placement above the root zone where the roots are growing. So if you had a clay soil, you could probably get away with one because that water is going to spread wider. But if you have uh, like a sandy loam, you, you, that second row will help you cover that, that root zone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. That's really helpful. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's going to help you get the uh, cover, cover more, uh, more um, square footage. Yes. Um, and then we have somebody else wanting to know your uh, special ingredient, uh, your, your secret sauce, right? Uh, where, where do you buy all those ingredients? Can I find them most places or do I have to go someplace special? Uh, yeah, you can find them most places. Uh, Well-stocked nursery store. You can buy them online. I, I was trying to find the label for one of them um, and I found it on Amazon. High yield. Uh, I've seen that a lot of garden stores. You, you could go to your garden store. They may have their own blend. Um, and these are fairly common um ingredients you know bone meal blood meal these 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 are things you'll find at, at most nurseries um at the very least i mean like a, a ace hardware home depot lowe's one of these places in their their little garden section they'll have a bag of like a bandini or arizona's best rose food i don't think that would be as good as this as this custom blend but at the very least that's where you could get it uh 
so I would I would think most of your 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 nurseries and garden shops would have these these uh, in blood meal and bone meal phos super phosphorus these are these are pretty common uh, material uh, as f fish emulsion that's another good one for roses yeah okay great and then just another confirmation we can put our mini pep line underneath the mulch we can put it down on on grade and just cover it with the mulch I do yeah, I, yeah. it works it works great I, I like it that way because I'm not trying to run the water through the mulch and then into the soil and keep it right on the soil and get it in there and and uh, let the, the mulch act as a, as a buffer to, to keep that evaporation from happening. Yeah, I like it very much too, Andy, just from aesthetically pleasing point of view. You know, I'm not seeing any uh, anything popping up uh, in, into my garden that, that's taking my uh, sight away from my roses. So I, I like doing that. So well, listen, Andy, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> great job today. Uh, I certainly know we're all uh, uh, more educated today uh, after your presentation than we were before. And uh, we're excited to get out into our gardens, especially here in the spring and grow those roses. I see your name uh, and inform contact information. If we have a question on roses or irrigation or anything, we, we can go ahead and contact you. Please do. Uh, like I said, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll help you find it. Uh, but yeah, email, cell, uh, yeah, let us know. And I'll be glad to help wherever, uh, however I can. Okay, great. Thank you again, Andy. Uh, very excited to uh, learn this. Uh, we'll be back on Friday with Jim uh, Couth, a friend of yours uh, from Arizona. He's going to be talking about what is smart irrigation. And I want to remind everybody, you know, next Friday, we've got uh, Charles Fishman uh, is going to be our guest talking about the big thirst 10 years after he wrote that book. We're going to interview Charles. And we're going to find out if what he actually wrote about uh, came true and uh, what we can learn from uh, what, what didn't. So that'll be very good uh, week from Friday on that. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon, giving us your time. Uh, we'll be back here on Friday. And uh, please remember all of our uh, videos are uh, recorded, of course, and kept at the Jane website, janesusa.com. Uh, under trainings, you can see them all there. We're on uh, Google, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as well. So check us out there if you want to uh, do it while you're driving job to job. So again, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you Friday. Thanks again, Andy. Hey, thanks, everybody. We'll see you.